So thank you so much to uh, Vipog and uh, Rain. In this next panel, we will look at how the maritime industry is in the middle of a substantial transformation. And moderating this panel is uh, Ronnie Borge, the managing director of uh, Heron Advisory. On his panel, we have the executive director of Singapore Maritime Institute, Sanjay Kutan, Magnus Lande, uh, head of APAC at the NEGL Veracity, Chepo Chua, at, uh, the founder of Ships Focus, Hermann Stern, partner at the Bog uh, Rhein, and finally, Håkon Ellerskjær, who's head of venture 3D printing and open innovation at Wilhelmsen in Singapore. Bonnie, over to you. Thank you, Paul. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this discussion on transforming the maritime industry. Thanks again to Håkon and to Hermann, who are joining us remotely today from Oslo and Singapore, respectively. Uh, and to Sanjay, Chaipo, and Magnus for joining me here in the studio in Singapore. Thank you also to our segment sponsor, Vikbog and Rhein. Now, my fellow panelists bring a wealth of knowledge and experience to our panel, coming from a wide range of marit maritime industry segments, and I look forward to our discussions. In the previous panel, Tech at Work, the panelists discussed the major trends in technology impacting on our work environment, something that applies across all industries. And our keynote speakers and following panels focused also on some of the major international trends that we see. In this panel, we will be focusing on one specific industry, namely maritime, which is a key industry in both Singapore and Norway, and in particular for the Norwegian business community here in Singapore. Now, recently, Søren Skau, the CEO of Maersk, uh, the world's largest shipping company, was quoted as saying that COVID-19 brought digitalization in the industry forward by three to five years. Now, the maritime industry is no stranger to major global events and macroeconomic incidents impacting on its operations. However, this is the first time we have been forced to do all of our work remotely and digitally. And even though there have been some obvious challenges, I think it's safe to say that global logistics is still moving, technology adoption has been given a boost, and we are learning a lot along the way. But this is not only the workings of a global pandemic, rather also a development that has been gaining momentum over the past few years. We have seen numerous technological advancements across other industries in the past 20 years, and shipping is finally starting to catch up with its industry peers. In Maritime, we spend a lot of time talking about transformation and talking about digitalization, but the time has surely come to move from talk to action. And what better starting point than a global pandemic, thrusting us into a digital and remote work future where technology is at the core of how we operate and do our business. In the famous words of Sir Winston Churchill, never let a good crisis go to waste. Now, there are several global trends impacting the maritime industry. I'd say the key ones include an ever more digital and data-driven decision-making process, a drive towards increased automation and integration across the supply chains, and increased transparency and the global drive towards decarbonization. Even though we have limited time at our disposal, we will try to cover each of these through our discussion in the next hour. We will also be discussing the key factors for succeeding with transformation, collaboration, open innovation, and access to capital. And towards the end, our esteemed panelists will be sharing their views on the future of the industry and where they see the industry moving in the next few years. So with that being said, let's get down to business. Now, starting with the three major trends, being digitalization and data, automation and integration, and transparency and decarbonization. Now, I'm gonna to jump to you first, uh, Magnus. I don't think anyone on the panel works more with data than DMEGL and you and your team at Veracity. Could you share a bit more about your take on data as a factor in digitalization, as well as on the work being carried out with regards to data standardization? <clears throat> I can, Ronnie. Thank you for the question and thank you for having me. Uh, of course, data has been at the forefront and the core of the NVIDIA for more than 150 years, uh, starting out the whole reason for class to uh, hold information about the uh, integrity of assets. Um, having now moved over to the third uh, industrial uh, revolution that came about with uh, computers and softwares, we have, of course, collected immense amount of data, um, which now with the fourth industrial revolution, providing technologies to start to use this data, for more than just managing risk, but also to provide automation and, and, and efficiency gains and also drive completely new business models. 
this is what uh, what we see and this is also the reason why we started uh, veracity because uh, data will become is already becoming an asset for everyone um, where you will manage your data just like you manage your ship you have a hsecq manager for your ship and you will probably need to have an hsecq manager for your data um, but you will also need technology to manage this data and this is what um, is missing to a large degree in shipping which we are offering amongst other with uh, with veracity the technology of course only takes you so far uh, if the technology cannot speak to each other um, then the efficiencies will not be taken out and the costs might be higher than the gains and that is why as Ronde mentions standards are key so we are heavily invested in the NVGL to push the boundaries on, on coming to the um, with standards uh, and implementing them such as open industry standards ISO standards uh, etc um, and without them you, you will not be able to do what you do on your leisure time by taking your Garmin watch and tracking your run sharing it with your Garmin app and then sharing it further on with your Strava app without doing anything that is data standards and data connectors that make that possible and I think the final point I just want to make on data standards is of course that that will also um, facilitate what is missing a uh, link in digital and that is trust if you cannot trust the data to, that you will act upon to make more and more business critical decisions then um, it will be difficult and the standards will provide you a backdrop to verify against I guess that's a starting point from my side thank you Magnus um... Moving on to you, uh, Sanjay, when we last sat down together, our conversation also touched upon data and uh, with two factors in particular, which was availability and accuracy. Uh, would you care to elaborate a little bit on that from, from your point of view as, as SMI? Yeah, sure, uh, Ron. Important question because um, Industry 4.0 has taught us a few things and that is not about big, it's not only about big data, but it's purposeful data. That means why are we collecting this data? and what type of data we are collecting is key. Uh, is it a minute data, second data, uh, hourly data, because it has to serve a purpose. Otherwise, the algorithms that you develop will not converge at a decent rate that allows decision making to happen. If you need a short term decision making, then you want the right set of data so that the algorithms can converge and you can make a decision. Uh, you know, if you can afford a longer time than to make this type of analysis. The other thing to be cognizant about is that uh, sensors today still drift. So there's a recalibration that's always required. And until, and I've seen some new uh, solutions come up where they triangulate uh, the data to make sure that the sensors are actually not drifting. So the data that you're collecting is also accurate. And I think all these things need to come together. So it's just not data, but the type and quality of data is also essential if you're gonna make major decisions around. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Chaipo, in your work with, um, with uh, say building startups and funding startups, uh, a lot of the startups we see in recent years are, are working around analytics and also around data. Uh, but again, we move to the point of like having access to the data, having good data. How, how do you see this from, from your point of view as, a, as, an, as, as an innovator in this space? I think for startups, uh, there are startups that focus on large companies as their customers. But I, uh, the startups that I build tend to focus uh, with customers that are unserved or underserved. So they look for companies that are not the large maritime companies. So they tend to be uh, companies that have fewer uh, affinity with data and even uh, digitalization. So that is an interesting space because these companies um, have very little uh, access to technology. So, you know, we approach it uh, uh, in a way uh, we call it a ground tech rather than using terms like AI and machine learning and a blockchain to scare them. We uh, focus on getting them a digital tool uh, so that you know it helps uh, in their operations. And from that uh, usage of the digital tools, they will start to collect data. And then we uh, use, for, for example, a dashboard to uh, display or demonstrate to them the usefulness of data. So it comes naturally as a result of the adoption to a, a tool that is very much in a, a part of their operations. 
Excellent. I think um, particularly this larger companies versus smaller companies is a thing that we will be coming back to uh, also later when we move on to talk about collaboration. And it's also something that Magnus and I discussed uh, as late as yesterday, I think, um, and that particular subject of how do we how do we work with all of the very many SMEs and smaller and medium-sized operators in this space, which actually make up the majority of, of all companies in the maritime industry. Um, that's something that we will come back to. Um, we will move on to the second trend, uh, because I do also want to bring in Herman and Hawkon in this. And the second part, and the second trend here is automation and integration. Um, now, we cannot be joined by one of the foremost experts in autonomy and automation in Norway without bringing that into our discussion. And in Norway, we're seeing um, yet another clear example of actions by a buyer of freight and transportation services, in this case, OSCO, uh, which is a major operator in the Norwegian uh, food and retail sector, uh, now starting out with, with, a, with a major project to, to put autonomous vessels transporting uh, some of their trucks and cargoes around the world. Um, now, Hamon, glad to have you with us from, uh, from Oslo this morning. Um, could you please elaborate a little bit more on this initiative, um, as I understand that you and Vico Gain are quite heavily involved in the OSCO project? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ronnie. That's uh, that's correct. We are very much involved in uh, in that project. And uh, and first of all, uh, I can can start by saying that uh, that is just one uh, example of uh, a trend that we are seeing, which is uh, um, autonomous ships. Um, I think what you will see, uh, and which uh, OSCO is an example of, is that you will see a gradual introduction of autonomous technology, but with some big leaps, and, and the OSCO project is one of those uh, big leaps. And, uh, and uh, the Norwegian Maritime Cluster is taking a leading role internationally, which is, you can also see in the OSCO project. And, and we as lawyers are uh, involved in that project and other projects uh, since the uh, autonomous nature of uh, uh, this technology has significant legal implications, uh, both when it comes to the building, but also the management, maintenance, uh, operation, and of course, liability in case something goes wrong, uh, as well as insurance uh, aspects. And uh, when it comes to autonomy, uh, there are actually several different degrees of autonomy. Uh, the IMO operates with four levels of autonomy from what they call automated support for the crew all the way up to a uh, fully autonomous ship. Now, there are actually several examples of uh, automated support systems already uh, in use in, in several vessels. And that is something which is increasingly uh, being uh, applied uh, and examples here are advanced uh, autopilots, uh, automatic uh, docking systems especially for ferries and also ferries with systems for autom automatically crossing of fjords. Uh, there are several examples in, in Norway for example the, the Bostø Fosen ferries across the Oslo fjord. One of their ferries is an automatic uh, ferry uh, and also on the west coast. Uh, and, and OSCO is one of uh, those big leaps and I think it will be, uh, well OSCO first of all, this, that is uh, Norway's largest grocery wholesaler and, and what they're doing is that they are building two electric and autonomous uh, vessels that will carry trailers uh, with their own cargo across Oslo Fjord between Horten and Moss. So that's actually the same uh, trip where the Buster ferry is going today automatically. But the idea is that uh, these two um, vessels for OSCO, they will be fully autonomous. Um, they will start out by uh, having two crew members on board uh, and doing testing. Uh, it's estimated that that will happen in uh, 2021 or 22. And then after some time with testing, uh, there will be a transition period uh, and then the vessels will sail fully autonomously. Uh, these vessels, they are equipped uh, largely with the Norwegian uh, equipment, um, mainly supplied by Kongsberg. It will be managed by uh, Masterly, which is a Norwegian company. It's a joint venture between Kongsberg and Neil Wilhelmsen. And OSCO is actually planning on using uh, electric or hydrogen powered trucks at each end of the transport chain, uh, which will actually make the entire supply chain uh, emission free. 
And both this project and also another very uh, famous project, the Yara Birkeland uh, case, uh, which is um, uh, Yara, the, uh, the fertilizer company, uh, they are building the world's first electric and autonomous container ship, which is going to sail at uh, the south coast of, of Norway. And both these projects, ASCO and the Yara project, they have received quite big grants from the Norwegian government uh, uh, enterprise Enova of uh, uh, 16 and 14 million dollars uh, respectively. And, and both of these projects will uh, lower the costs, uh, they will save uh, quite a lot of truck kilometers uh, per year, um, both the Ara project and our school uh, project, and obviously it will uh, it will um, contribute to to reduce uh, emissions quite substantially. Excellent, thank you, uh, thank you, Hamon, and I think on on this you end up also touching upon several other uh, aspects. Uh, that we will come back to uh, one being collaboration because these projects foster, it require a lot of collaboration on very many different levels both private and public um, mm -hmm. and another one that we will come back to in in the next part of, of, of the segment which is also capital and funding uh, both private and government um, as well as uh, the decarbonization issue which we're also touching upon shortly um, because a lot of these initiatives also lead to an emission-free supply chain um, I think it also leads to another factor, which is integration of the supply chain, because we see the, uh, the cargo owner, in a sense, taking much more responsibility for the whole journey of their cargos, uh, mm. sort of factory to dealer, so to speak, uh, similar as we've seen with the Arbitkland project, project as well. Um, now, moving from, um, from autonomy to, to other innovative projects in, in, uh, uh, in our industry, uh, which is that of additive manufacturing and 3D printing. Uh, first of all, Håkon, congratulations. Uh, yesterday, uh, you and Willemsen signed an MOU with ThyssenKrupp to establish a joint venture in additive manufacturing here in Singapore, uh, which is building on the collaboration that I understand started last year. Um, now, we want to get back to the collaboration part, uh, but could you first share a little bit about the 3D printing initiative here in Singapore and how that has developed? Because given yesterday's developments, I, I believe it's going quite well. Thank you, Ronny, and also thank you for inviting me to this uh, session. Um, the, what we've been doing on the 3D printing side in, in Wilhelmsen and as we're doing with our other ventures that we're developing uh, in the company is to solve customer-specific pain points. And being in the maritime industry for more than 150 years, we know that spare parts is a huge pain point uh, for our customers, for the vessel owners and, and managers. And three years ago, we saw that the 3D printing technology was maturing uh, in other industries, such as aviation, aerospace, automotive, et cetera. Uh, and we then saw that marrying uh, this technology on demand, decentralized technology with the pain points in the maritime industry, uh, was, a, was a winning match uh, because today's pain points is that uh, the vessel managers uh, have issues in terms of lead times, obsolete parts and high cost of the parts. And, and due to the nature of shipping that the vessels are moving all the time, spare parts are being shipped all around the world and stored all around the world. And that is a quite costly model. So for many of the spare parts, being able to produce these parts close to the point of need is hence a very competitive alternative. And we must also remember that a quite large of uh, or a quite large portion of the maritime fleet is about 15 years old. So then service agreements expires with the OEMs. You have obsolete parts becoming more and more more prevalent, meaning suddenly the uh, a vessel um, and the vessel crew and the procurement departments have issues and difficulties in, in sourcing and finding spare parts. Uh, hence, that's why we embarked on this journey. Uh, and together with now Tyson Group, we are further strengthening our position, bringing on board then a 200 year old company uh, in the materials business who will then spend a lot of more than a decade in 3D printing uh, on board and then establishing a new company uh, together with them. Thank you. Um, so I think with with those couple of examples, also from the sort of automation and further integration in the industry and, and other initiatives that go sort of cross industry, 
Um, we will move forward also with uh, the third uh, trend, which is transparency and decarbonisation. Um, now we're seeing a massive pressure on transparency and on decarbonisation coming from society as well as coming from the buyers of transportation. I mean, the OSCO case is an example of this. We're seeing it from uh, from major charters in the world and others who are now putting an increased amount of pressure on our industry to do better, to become more transparent and also to drive the decarbonisation agenda much more so than we have been able to do ourselves uh, or than governments have been doing as well. Um, now, I wanted to follow a little bit further on to what Hawken was talking about now, because another thing that me and Hawken have discussed uh, when we were having a chat prior to this uh, panel debate was um, the, uh, 3D, 3D, the, the carbon footprint aspect of these changes and improvements that, that you are doing, for example, with spare parts. Could you touch a little bit on the uh, carbon footprint uh, side of this as well? Definitely. I think it goes without saying that when you move from a centralized production model, uh, where you're shipping parts, storing parts to a decentralized uh, production model, the, the carbon footprint is significantly less, uh, which is a very positive uh, side effect uh, of on-demand decentralized manufacturing. Uh, and it's something that is also on the top of the agenda uh, for our uh, customers, for sure. Um, during one of our discussions, uh, you also mentioned stakeholders and regulatory pressure as two key elements when it comes to decarbonization. Could you elaborate a little bit on that <clears throat> from your point of view? Yeah, for sure. It's um, it's um, no secret that the climate crisis is uh, is upon all of us, um, which uh, puts pressure from stakeholders and and, and, and regulations. Uh, we all know that uh, sustainability is uh, increasingly uh, more important for both listed and unlisted companies, and um, you mentioned it yourself, you see the cargo owners starting to stick their hands closer down to the business models of their subcontractors. Yeah. And this is highly driven by sustainability because it's becoming a business risk. And, uh, you know, latest yesterday, you saw Lloyd's List having an article about $300 for CO2 um, tax put forward by Trafigura. So, so, yeah. so this, is, this is coming and companies are preparing. And I can bet you now that there are so many companies this fall that will spend their time on figuring out how to add sustainability into their business risk, um, scratching their heads. And the regulatory pressure that has basically just started to pave the wave in terms of putting forward CO2 reporting. And of course, that's the first step towards something more. And most likely taxing something more likely uh, programs to, to help support industry also. I don't think it will only be the, the, the whip, there will also be carrots, I think, and hope. Mm. So I think this is, um, this is just the beginning we have seen. Right. And right. Sanjay, uh, moving to you on this as well, uh, what are the key projects that SMI and maybe also Singapore are focusing on with regards to decarbonization? So I see you nodding along when, when Magnus is talking here. Yeah, so, so before I jump into projects, I think uh, <laughs> I think it's important to contextualize this whole effort around decarbonization. Uh, one is, it is an existential issue, and if you don't accept that, then there's no point moving forward. The greatest resource of decarbonization that we need to keep our eye on is actually time, because if we don't get it done in a particular amount of time, then all our efforts are going to go to waste. Mm. Now, with, with that background, then we need to start thinking about how do we move fast enough to get enough scale in the shortest amount of time so that we can deliver the true value of decarbonization effort. And I think, uh, I think last week, uh, if you've been tracking the news, we just announced uh, a, a program around the uh, electrification of harbour crafts. I think uh, that is within the accountability of the Singapore uh, jurisdiction. So that is something that we can do something about. The ports, if you uh, are being redesigned to be sustainable and green in the future, and you know Singapore is not blessed with a lot of renewables, but whatever renewables we can extract from, and the ports are looking at it. I think the other thing to remember, decarbonization isn't a one-zero equation. Uh, every effort, whether it's one percent or hundred percent, makes a difference to the way we operate today. So energy efficiency, waste heat recovery, removal of waste stage, and this is where data can actually help because you're 
most systems are sub-optimized at the system or system levels. Mm -hmm. So we need to be smarter in the way we use our resources to help that whole decarbonization story. And it's really about pace. Mm -hmm. We need to right, get the pace right in our decision making, in our execution, our demonstration and our scaling. Excellent, and I think uh, this is a this is a good time to transition into the second part uh, of our discussion, which is exactly around collaboration. Uh, and I think uh, this is one of the areas where I think there is great room also for collaboration uh, between Norway and Singapore as being one of the things we are talking about uh, here today at the Singapore Norway Innovation Conference is how can we strengthen the bonds between our two respective countries um, and. With that, I want to go back to, to Herman again in Oslo because one of the areas where Norway is very strong is in electrification and in a lot of the elements around this. And Norway is doing a lot of projects also on electrification of all of its ferries. I think it's by 2025 and a number of other initiatives around that. I mean, we are blessed with an endless amount of renewable energy, uh, unlike most countries, uh, but we are still doing a, a, a massive effort to, to, uh, to electrify a lot of our transportation, uh, particularly our transportation on water. Would you like to elaborate a little bit on that, uh, Herman? Yes, I can. Um, the, the projects that I mentioned are uh, quite good examples, actually, of uh, uh, electrification because uh, they are short sea um, transportation. It is a question of crossing a fjord, or in the Yara Bitlan case, uh, it's going up and down uh, a fjord. Um, and uh, in those cases, uh, since the distance is not that far and uh, you don't need that uh, high speed, uh, it's, it's perfectly fine to, to use um, electric propulsion. And also, uh, you can charge in, uh, in both ends. Uh, there are different systems with changing batteries or charging, and both these projects are based on actually having charging stations uh, at both ends. So while you're doing loading or unloading at the same time you are you are charging and the idea is to have automatic docking so docking will go extremely uh, quickly and and safely and uh, and the vessel will immediately start to to charge uh, sanjay is is this an area where you're already collaborating and is are there projects being looked at now that are within the area of electrification, for example, or other projects yeah, between, and, between Norway and Singapore in particular? Uh, most definitely. Uh, if you look at the call for proposal, it demands a collaboration, collaborative effort. And this is because I think we don't actually believe that any one person in the value chain of creating a vessel which is electrified is going to solve the problem. So we've actually asked for a joint industry to for people to come together to collaborate to actually deliver the full sol solution. What we've been trying to push, a mission-centric type of research, where the mission is, I want to electrify my harbor crafts and get it floating on the water and operating, right? And uh, I think Chaipo and I had a discussion on business models, or I think maybe naive on our part to say that <laughs> we also want the right business models, but uh, like Chaipo reminded me, the businessman will get the right business model. But I think at the end of the day, it is a collaborative effort. It takes yep. multiple stakeholders to make this happen, government included, but we need to work together. And I think anyone who's going to try and do it by themselves, as again, pace is going to be very important. So how do we do this fast? Chapo. I think everybody understands decarbonization. But what is important uh, to understand is um, most part of the business is self-organized in maritime. But when it comes to decarbonization initiative, this cannot be expected. It requires regulators to um, really uh, push the button. And you know, when you set the policies clearly, I think the business will follow suit. Then you know, then our goal for the de uh, de decarbonized world will will you know be achieved. Uh, so. Moves now. into sort of the regulatory uh, part part of things. Uh, how how important? And I'll direct this to 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 all of the panelists. Really, how important is the regulation aspect versus uh, sort of carrot and stick in the sense that Magnus was touching up or touching upon earlier? How important is the regulatory or aspect or the uh, the regulation aspect versus 
also uh, incentive aspects that a lot of governments operate with both here and, and, and back home. And I want I want uh, Herman and, and Håkon to comment on this afterwards as well, but I'll, I'll start with the gentleman on stage here. Uh, I think absolutely important, just like uh, what uh, I mentioned about decarbonization. And then in terms of uh, incentive for innovation, I think uh, without uh, government support, it's very hard for innovation to uh, actually you know, go to the extent of being adopted and becoming useful. So yeah. uh, the government policies and you know, in, uh, in, incentivizing the uh, whether it's the startup or the corporates, uh, the entrepreneurs are uh, absolutely important. And uh, thank you. And I think that's something we're seeing uh, if in 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 say in, in both countries and in in, in both uh, in environments and. Um, I mean, in, in that respect, uh, you recently uh, went entered, entered into partnership with Quest Ventures, which is a Singapore-based venture capital firm, uh, because you were selected as one of the six uh, venture capital firms in Singapore that got uh, access to a, a um, to a, a fund, in a sense, of uh, of sixty million dollars that uh, that Seeds Capital, which is a subsidiary of, of Enterprise Singapore, uh, put out purely for innovation in the maritime space. Um, and how how important is that? Like, how are you seeing any developments from that initiative, which came out last year? Is this driving innovation further? Are you working on specific projects, for uh, example? Definitely, uh, we are looking at uh, supporting some startups. Um, there are a few critical components, and funding is uh, one very very important one. So if you don't help the startups uh, and you know get the investment into the startups or right startups. Then you know it is very hard for the startups to move to scale their solutions. So, and yeah, you are right. Uh, we have uh, actually uh, started two uh, startups earlier this year. Uh, COVID nineteen didn't help, but you know still uh, things are proceeding, and we we are very excited about this uh, uh, space out here, uh, particularly uh, Asia. Uh, unlike what is happening in Europe and USA, I think the growth in Asia will continue um, in one way or another. And the startups uh, in the maritime uh, space specifically have very, very bright future. Thank you. Any comments on that from the other panelists? Uh, well, you know, from, from me, policy is important because it sends the right signal to industry about the sustainability uh, that comes with it you know because businesses need to decide am i going to invest in something where the the policy is not clear then how do i manage around that so policy gives a, a very important signal to industry yes we want to do this we're heading the right direction now whether it is a good policy or bad policy that's a that's a different question altogether but i think in most parts uh, with a bit of um, uh, thinking behind it, we normally get our policies right. Now the question really is whether it's incentivized or is it a stick? And I think in that case, we need to look whether the market, there's a market failure that requires incentive to help the entire industry bridge over, or the market is there, they just need to have, have a stick to get everyone moving. And if these I are the kind of things you have to balance with the uh, limited uh, mm. funding you get from the Ministry of Finance, so to say. You know? Everybody makes mistakes. Uh, <laughs> uh, if I have a word for the regulators, for the policy makers, don't be afraid of making mistakes. So a bad policy is no uh, worse than no policy. So if, if it is a you know wrong policy, you can change. Uh, and you know as long as people understand that. For example, decarbonization. There will be a policy in terms of the, you know, how much is acceptable, and you set the a clear rule, you know, one year, two year, three years down the road, what is expected, and then the business will, you know, expect and then make adjustment to meet those uh, requirements. Sure. Mm. <clears throat> Thank you, um, Herman. Moving moving back to you in in Oslo again. Um, you mentioned, of course, that in this OSCO project, uh, there is uh, there's funding coming from government entities that are supporting this initiative. Uh, but if we go, for example, to the Yara Birkeland project, that was very much a private initiative that then got the government to come in and support from the policy point of view, from the legislative point of view, 
as a part of the collaboration, but it started as a private initiative. Um, mm -hmm. And also, you, of course, one thing is the government has made it a policy that all ferries in Norway will be electric by 2025, if I recall correctly. So that's definitely, it has to be that way, otherwise it won't be allowed to operate. Uh, and then they combine that with, with the funding aspect. But would, would, you, would, would we have seen these projects if there wasn't uh, also the government's involvement as it has been, be it Birkeland or ASCO or others? I, I think uh, both yes and no. I think uh, the Abigon project may have happened without. I'm not quite sure. The Oscar project would probably not happen, uh, and the this government support was uh, was decisive in, in that uh, project. Uh, although the, the, I mean there are very strong underlying drivers, as we discussed. I mean one thing is to is the potential to to save costs by by uh, um, making the transport chain more efficient and uh, for example having fewer crew members on board increasing safety and reducing emissions and also the fact that uh, the cargo interests are able to uh, to take charge of the entire supply chain that is also a big uh, big driving force but I, but I think the government support will be uh, important in in some time because this is uh, a technology which is uh, under development so it is at the moment it's, it's very expensive technology but obviously it will become uh, cheaper and, and more um, available and then I guess it's, it's you can compare it to electric cars when when the costs come down then eventually you don't need those financial incentives and it floats uh, by itself but, but I think the collaboration with the authorities are are still key uh, for, for this type of, uh, of a technology. I mean, one, one thing is that uh, uh, you need to develop a, a suitable uh, legal framework. Uh, today's legal framework is based on the premise that there are people on board the vessels. That is not the case with, especially with uh, fully autonomous uh, vessels. So you have a lot of things happening on the international level with uh, the IMO working uh, on international solutions by amending existing conventions or uh, drafting uh, new ones but that will take time uh, probably many years so therefore i think international trade with fully autonomous ships will probably not happen for some time but that is much easier on a national level which you see in norway for example uh, because there the, the government can more easily regulate their own uh, territory and, and in Norway, there's a unique cooperation between the Norwegian Maritime Cluster and the Norwegian authorities. And the authorities, especially the Norwegian Maritime Directorate and the Norwegian Coastal Authorities, they are actually not only positive, but they are actively supporting the industry. So they have established several testing areas along the coast, and, uh, and they are very active in developing a regulatory framework. And, and, and giving the necessary exceptions from today's regulations um, in, in order to, to facilitate this testing and, and eventually trading. And, and going back to what was said with, uh, with the close cooperation between various stakeholders, that's also obviously extremely important with this uh, technology. Uh, it's necessary to develop uh, technology which can be integrated with different sensors and systems speaking together. Um, both on board the vessel, but also the interface between the vessel and the docking systems, for example. Uh, in the Arabiklan project, the plan is to make the cranes autonomous as well. So there's a lot of things that need to, to talk together. Um, and also uh, there needs to be uh, proper business models developed, on, especially on the roles that these new players on the market will, will play, especially the suppliers of this technology. To what degree will they be integrated in the operation of the vessel, the service agreements and, and running operation, and also the, the remote controllers, uh, which Masterly is a, is a good example of. And also there needs to be um, certainty from a public perspective that there's a perception that this is a safe uh, and sound uh, technology. Thank you. Uh, we we did we did lose a few seconds of what you were saying there, at least at our end. Uh, but I think the, the the total message came through uh, loud and clear. Um, Walk on this. This is also a case with with some of your projects that that you work with at Willemsen. I mean, you you work a lot with the three D and, and additive manufacturing side of things. But Willemsen runs a lot of projects uh, on the innovation side uh, across several different divisions of the corporation. Some of them are done in Norway, uh, including the 
the sort of digitalization and data side of things are mostly done in Norway, whilst the more the more sort of hardware projects take place in Singapore. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Because um, you also collaborate a lot with the government here, but also I guess the government back in Norway, and uh, as well as with the private sector in both 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 cities and countries. Yes, definitely. Um... I think when when bringing innovative and disruptive technologies and services to the market, the traditional model of innovation becomes uh, obsolete or it's, or it's not working, uh, which is being internally focused, closed off from outside ideas, uh, etc. Et and, and and the model that we are working uh, according to in in the open innovation team uh, is that approach, open innovation. Uh, leveraging both internal and external sources of ideas uh, and taking them to the market through uh, multiple paths. And in these ecosystems, we're working with multiple partners. We're working with technology partners, we're working with customers, and we're also working with regulators uh, to bring these products and services to the market. And just as a concrete example here in Singapore, the Maritime Port Authority has called for proposals from joint industry programs. And and, uh, and and what they ask for in these programs is that you bring on board the original equipment manufacturers, meaning the spare parts manufacturers. You bring on board the technology partners, meaning the manufacturing uh, competence, digitization competence. Uh, you bring on board classification, which is a very important part uh, of spare parts, providing assurance and approving the part. Uh, creating this ecosystem of partners that is able to uh, bring new solutions to the market. Uh, and the quickest and most successful way of doing this is through this ecosystem approach, um, which I think is, 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 is important, and especially bringing down the barriers for adoption. Uh, and you will manage that through building such ecosystems. And we're also doing that across several ventures that we that are developing. One of them is the 3D printing venture that we do in Williamson Marine Products. Uh, but we also uh, have a venture on, on smart ropes, uh, measuring uh, and live monitoring of the tension of the ropes, increasing safety and also uh, uh, increasing the lifetime of the ropes because you're reducing the low ropes correctly. Also through Digiboiler, which is an uh, automatic dosing of boiler uh, water treatment in boilers uh, to make sure that the boiler doesn't uh, fail. Uh, where you see that one of 10 boiler, uh, boilers fail every year, which is both costly and very dangerous. Uh, and as you see across these uh, ventures, we're working in the ecosystem very closely with our customers, uh, technology partners, and also regulators. Uh, I think one thing that we um, uh, that that sort of ties a lot of these things together is, uh, I mean, one one thing being the respective governments, but another one being the class society and the MEGO if I'm not mistaken, is involved in almost every project we've mentioned so far. <laughs> uh, not specifically because you're on stage, but it just happens so that, that the MEGL is involved in a lot of these projects, both in Norway and uh, and in, in Singapore as a leading classification society. Uh, what, is, what, what is your role in this and how, how, how does the MEGL then, like, or more, more so, what is the MEGL's uh, thought behind being so involved in driving a number of these projects because one thing is being asked to assess something or classify it another one is being actively involved in driving this forward what is uh, what is the reasoning behind this why, why is the image also active in, in driving uh, innovation uh, across a broad range of the maritime industry I think um, thanks for the question Rone. I think this is um, a major part why we still are alive and breathing and uh, much so, um, you know, we we are a foundation, really. So the profit we gain goes back into the company. We spend five percent of our yearly revenue directly into research to safeguard life, property, and the environment, and that's what we do. That's our purpose. Um, so whatever we do, we do to uh, stay alive, to do and serve that well, and that of course uh, involves needing to stay close to the uncertainties, staying close to the edge of where technology operating models, uh, ecosystems are moving. Uh, and that's why we, we venture on, for example, on creating the digital solutions business area. We did two years ago, 1,000 people strong. Why we launched Veracity, uh, having grown up to more than 200,000 users and uh, 20,000 companies. 
it is because we see that we can if we can serve our purpose by providing facilitation assurance technology um, we will do it and that's where yeah it's a a, a big uh, muscle that we can use uh, to do so excellent thank you uh, and one thing is sitting here and talking about all the things that 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 are going well and all the success stories and the projects that are going well, uh, the, the government funds that the companies are receiving for their projects um, uh, and sharing some of the some of the success stories, which is important. We have to talk about the things that we have achieved. Uh, but one thing that Chaipo also brought up when, when we were having a chat uh, a few weeks back is, is why is innovation and adoption in maritime commerce not more successful? Like what are the reasons we are not getting some of these projects done and why are the reason some we're not succeeding with some of the innovation projects that we start out in the industry i term this generally as uh, innovation and adoption conundrum um, it is no uh, different in uh, other industries and maritime industry but in our industry we have a very complex nature that hinders digitalization. And if we don't get ourselves on digitalization, forget about all other kind of technologies like AI, blockchain, and so on. So that conundrum uh, starts with a very complex industry, which uh, uh, the nature of numerous nodes, extensively uh, diversified, long chain, um, distributed flows, whether it's workflow or data flow, tedious operations, which requires remote management. So these are some of the nature that actually result in challenges already in simplicity, standardization, connectivity, reliability, uh, predictability, and all these. And these are actually challenges innate in maritime. And of course, uh, digitalization is exactly uh, suited to solve all these uh, challenges as well. That's why it's a very interesting uh, conundrum that we are facing. And uh, I want to follow up on that. How, how do we get past that? How do we solve it? I think uh, uh, the number one uh, point is that there is an underestimation of this conundrum. Mm. So we need to recognize it. And having recognized it, we need to acknowledge it. So recognizing is internal, acknowledging is external. And the sooner we can do that, the you know the more we are able to um, embrace uh, technology and uh, deal with deal with the uh, deal with it with the uh, solutions. So it is uh, uh, you know more efforts are put into the solutioning. To finding the ways to overcoming the conundrum. Anyone else want to comment on that, Magnus? Yeah, I can. I can add. I think also I, I fully agree with Chaipo here. And the biggest uh, uh, acknowledgement we need to do is that, or the biggest reason why we are not succeeding with the pace also with digital is because we're treating it digital far too digital. Digital is highly analog. Mm. If you're not treating it <laughs> strategic, uh, you, it's very difficult. You know, digital will lead to change. And what is change? difficult and what how do you treat the difficultness you treat it more strategically mm. and and if you don't acknowledge that um then it's going to be tough and i think that's the biggest part where we have been busting around on digital instead of thinking about what does it actually mean for our operating models what does it mean for our silo based thinking yeah and it's, that's one of the things that that we've looked at several times as well and that's the we're seeing we're seeing elements of digitalization we're seeing elements of of of, of innovation or new solutions across different parts, but uh, are we really seeing uh, innovation in respect to um, business models? Are we thinking about this on like the highest strategic level when we go forward? Are we are we collaborating enough? I would say a clear no. I mean, yes, we're collaborating, but we're not collaborating enough. Yes, we're sharing, but we're not sharing enough. Um, so I think that there are a number of factors here um, that, that that are key. Um, I think we've we've touched upon a number of of the um, elements that we that we wanted to discuss, but I but I would like to to continue a little bit more around the parts that are not working or what are the keys to success to to get there. Uh, Hawkon, you've I know that this is a bit of a, a pet peeve of yours as well, but what what are the key factors for succeeding? Like what 
why do the projects that you're working on now succeed? Why did the 3D printing thing uh, move forward? Uh, being open about collaboration, can you point to yeah. a couple of factors like I, how do you make it work? I think it is the ecosystem, ecosystem approach that we are adopting uh, in the ventures that we are developing. Uh, so meaning I'm, I'm almost co-creating with my customers in the solution and offering that we are developing. Uh, allowing me to uh, continuously and also systematically um, uh, validate uh, the offering. Um, and we ask three questions uh, constantly in the Open Innovation team, and that's, is there demand? Is there actually someone that wants this offering or product or service? Is it worth it? Is there a, is there a potential for sustainable business for Williamson? And can we do it? And we ask these questions systematically and continuously to make sure that we are on the right track. And if you're not, we need to re-evaluate uh, the venture and also the way forward. I think another element, it's, it's just to touch upon what had been said earlier, why, uh, what are the struggles today? And I think it's, it's, it's also about timing. Uh, because for instance, if you look at uh, uh, the data point of view, shipping has tons of data. Uh, but data has been localized and siloed for many years. And suddenly now, uh, we're able to communicate uh, through sensors on board the vessel, uh, but also from vessel to shore, allowing then IoT to become relevant in, in shipping. Uh, but we need to understand that this is also new technology for the shipping industry. So to uh, expect huge adoption on this new technology in a quite conservative industry, is challenging. And that's why it's so important that we adopt this ecosystem thinking and working together with the partners uh, to be able to bring down the barriers for adoption for this um, uh, selected or certain initiatives that we all are working on. Thank you, uh, Håkon. Um, now we've seen uh, quite a few developments of different factors of the ecosystems in the last few years. Um, both both here in Singapore as well as uh, as in Norway and other parts of the world as well. Um, some are private initiatives, some are public initiatives, and you see various initiatives coming around um, that is supporting this. And it's something that if you go five years back, it didn't exist. Uh, and we sit here now, and there's quite a few things happening. Um, any comments from uh, from the panelists on where is this exactly moving forward? Like, what what can we do more to to further drive this beyond what we've done? Is it more of the same, or do we need to think differently or approach it differently. I think, um, Ron, maybe I just chime in here. Um, I think the first mistake we are making is we, are, we use the word digitalization to assume it's a homogeneous animal and the solutions are all homogeneous. I think we need to recognize that digitalization is an umbrella which has a very heterogeneous landscape of solutions and problems that it addresses. And I think in the maritime sector, which is, is very interconnected, right? So the, the, the silos will, uh, uh, have been broken because of the process connection, but the maturity rate of the different digitalized solutions for the various parts of that supply chain are actually quite different. Mm. Some are more ready than the others. So it's very, when you start thinking of the digitalization, you know, we've thrown it, thrown, piecemeal solutions and trying to boost this up and hoping the other person will catch up. But what we should be doing is we should be stepping back and reimagining the entire landscape in a digitalized, digitalized state and then see how we can create the key solutions that draws that green line across that supply chain to make it greener. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because we've been so excited about it and we keep using the word not recognizing that it's actually heterogeneous in nature. And I think once we do that, then we really start strategizing how do we move forward together. So that's uh, something I think we need to start thinking about if we want to start solving it at a faster rate. In, in, in a sense, if, if you were going to invent shipping today or supply chain today, how would you do it? Yes. Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Um, I think with uh, with these comments, first from from Hawkon and and also from from Sanjay, we're moving towards the the end of our discussion. And I am being told that uh, that we do have less than ten minutes left uh, of our conversation here today. Um, 
So I think we will move on to to the um, to the where do we go from here part uh, of this discussion. Um, and I would like each of the panelists to share their two thoughts on where we move from here. What are the two key developments you see taking place in the next three to five years? Uh, in in a sense, where should we be investing our time and our money? Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate further on what you've already said. Uh, if not, I'll, I'll pass the mic on in a sense to uh, to Magnus and and and, and try oh, Just a time. quick one, just to add. I think uh, this morning we started off with an MOU between uh, Singapore and Norway. Yep. And I, in this journey, which is a new journey for many of us, we are all our students, right? And I think together, the two countries, if we can move fast enough, we can become mature students and teachers. Because once we hit the point where we can collaborate our expertise among our people uh, and the technologies to become teachers of the world, then we will have a, a opportunity to scale up very quickly. So I think we already took the first step with the MOU. And I think the, the next step is how do we build the capacity among our uh, employees and employers and you know to get to that scale where we can start creating the impact. Excellent, thank you. Um... Hawkon, did you want to add anything to your uh, point uh, about asking the three critical questions when you get uh, when you start with a new project? Um. I think if you if you look um, uh, on the future and the, where the innovation drive is moving, I think I want to um, emphasize uh, the uh, emerging open innovation approach. Um, uh, where we're working uh, in ecosystems to solve customer pain points. And being customer pain point driven is, is crucial going forward uh, and working with the customers to really understand these pain points. Um, I think this is a key focus area going forward and we have seen uh, uh, success from that from, from, from our end at least. Thank you. Uh, Herman, final words from Oslo? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to autonomous ships and, and the future, I think uh, the drivers, as we have talked about, they are definitely there. And I think uh, the uh, maritime industry is on a great path when it comes to cooperating uh, between the various stakeholders and also cooperation with uh, the authorities. And, and one example of, of uh, the vast cooperation between the various stakeholders is uh, a project called the Authorship Project, which was announced earlier this year. That's a Norwegian project, but it was it received an EU grant uh, in the amount of 24 million US dollars. And, and that consists of 20 stakeholders from the entire maritime cluster. Uh, some of the main players there is Kongsberg and, and Sintef, but it, it basically covers uh, the, um, the technical suppliers such as Kongsberg, maritime robotics, owners uh, and, uh, and users such as Equinord, G2 Ocean, Greek Star, Norwegian Cruise Line. Insurers such as Guard, uh, regulators such as Maritime Directorate and Coastal Directorate, and, and universities in, in Oslo and, and Trondheim, and several ports. And they will they will uh, they will do research and, and development within three areas, which is quite similar to the ones that I mentioned before. One thing is the technological uh, innovation, and uh, when it comes to situational awareness, artificial intelligence, and, and so on, and, and to integrate these systems and develop them further. And then it's to develop uh, new business models and uh, and uh, ensure uh, a safe and, and secure way of employing these ships within um, a legal framework, which uh, which uh, these stakeholders, together with the authorities, will will uh, cooperate to um, to create. Thank you, uh, Magnus. Yeah, uh, thanks for 30, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Yeah. So two thoughts. Uh, one, spend your time on. Um, in the boardroom in the C-level suite to figure out what digital will mean for you. Digital is about change, it's analog. If you don't start there and treating it strategically, for sure you will not manage to use anything on the toolbox to anything more than a pilot. And number two, so where do you then put your money? Uh, you put your money in making sure that the capabilities you require, technological, competency, uh, organizational, and culture, to make sure that they don't just work for the first and immediate one. Make sure that they scale and can provide the synergies just like in your everyday life on your mobile phone. Excellent. Chaipo, final words. Um, I would uh, like to emphasize less on success, encourage people to talk about their failures, why they fail, 
and you know help uh, the rest learn not to fail the same way and the way that i see success whether you know is one year or three years or five years is the current two track in maritime industry converge as one the two tracks is one that is talking about innovation and getting themselves uh, fully immersed in the innovation another part of it, maritime that is completely detached from what is happening around so when we see that you know these two are able to converge then i say that that is a success excellent and i think with that those will be our closing uh words uh for our panel today um we have heard uh from some experts across various sectors of the maritime industry um and i believe i will just leave their words to sort of stand for themselves uh rather than trying to summarize all of them into 30 seconds now at the end uh, but i do agree we need to talk more about failure uh, we need to take a step back and think more strategically about all of these elements of innovation and how we drive things forward um, to make sure that we invest our time and our money in the right place in particular if we're going to get anywhere with the most pressing issue of our time which is not you know, whether we get our data managed well enough here and there but actually decarbonization being one of the key factors that we all have to work really hard towards solving um, and we are in that respect running out of time as is our panel uh, so on that note i would like to thank uh, herman for joining us in oslo from equal grain our sponsor uh Pokon from joining us from the williams office here in singapore due to the COVID limitations of the number of people that can be in the studio at the same time and uh, Tripo, Magnus, and Sanjay for joining me here in the studio in Singapore. Um, and with that, I'll pass the word back to Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, uh, to all of you in this last final uh, panel before we go into the hard talk, the last panel here. Um, I just wanted to leave a, a specific comment uh, towards what Sandy was alluding to in his uh, last comment here. Yes, because of the disruptive technologies that we see in the maritime industry, like autonomy, like digital technology, and like decarbonization, it's been quite difficult to get a complete overview of who the stakeholders are. And this is why we teamed up in Innovation Norway, teamed up with the EMEGL, leveraging the Veracity platform to get a good overview of what the opportunities are and who the stakeholders are. A lot of new stakeholders coming into the sector with new disruptive technologies being used. Uh, we, in addition to uh, the MDGL Veracity, also collaborated with our headquarters, the Ocean Industries Hub, as well as several Norwegian companies that helped us uh, design uh, this mapping and, and getting it done. And we'll use this mapping when we mobilize this industry towards common opportunities between Singapore and Norway going forward. And that will be part of the MOU that, that we signed earlier today.